Praise be unto God. God has given us one more opportunity to gather in this manner to learn from the precious word. Today, our brother uh, Thomas Jacob will be continuing on the subject of uh, Christology. The last time that he took the class is on, on uh, 5th of November, almost to two weeks back. And we have been meditating upon the attributes, the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, the qualities, the divine, the divine qualities and the divine worship and concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. He is going to continue the studies on the same subject this morning also. Let's uphold him in our prayers. There is one song which uh, always uh, pops up in my mind. Always, you know, <clears throat> whenever I sit uh, idle uh, in my, in my uh, house or wherever I, I am, there is one song which, uh, <clears throat> which, uh, which always pops up in my mind. That is from our hymn book, uh, Oh Christ, <clears throat> Uh, uh, about, about, about about the Lord Jesus Christ. The chorus of the song I would like to sing this, this morning. And this is, that goes like this. Now none but Christ can satisfy none other name for me. It's like this. It, 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 it goes like this. Now none but Christ can satisfy None other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus found in thee. There is love, there is life and lasting joy we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is none other name that satisfies us. The Lord Jesus Christ is all in all to us. Christology is a subject which is the central subject for any Christian believer. From this, uh, we, we start all the other uh, the, the, the ministries, whether it is apologetics, whether it is the study of the word, whether it is an eschatology, whether it is bibliology, anything, you know, first you have to start from accepting and acknowledging our Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. And that is a very important subject. Our brother uh, Thomas Jacob is leading on the subject and let's uphold him in our praise. Let's uh, uh, commit our brother in, uh, in prayer before we get into the class. Shall we pray? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning time. Thank you, Lord, for thy precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is all in all to me. All in all to me, Jesus, he is all to me. Be the worldly cares perplexing, all my life is he. We thank you about him that we, we sing like this. Thou art the everlasting word, the Father's only Son. God manifestly seen and heard and heaven's beloved one. As we ponder upon the subject of Christology about the Lord Jesus Christ, the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ, the attributes of him, the qualities of him, the divine titles of him, and we continue, as we remember in the last class, he is the Lord of harvest. He is the Lord of Sabbath. He is my Lord, my God. May the Lord help each and every one of us to listen to the, uh, the continuation of this subject when our brother Thomas Jacob is going to expound this morning. Let's uphold him and, uh, and uh, let, let the Lord give him all the needed grace to, to speak unto us and we may be encouraged and edified and enriched by the, by the word of God this morning. We commit ourselves before you, Lord. Be with us. 
give us a, give us an attentive hearts to listen to this this study this morning we give the thanks praises and adorations unto you and ask this prayer in the sweet and precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen <clears throat> our brother thomas jacob will continue the studies from christology over to you brother thomas thank you brother good morning all of you warm greetings to all of you in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ how great it is to gather together in the morning to meditate upon our lord and our savior the lord jesus christ as we have just uh, remembered we are dealing and studying with the subject of christology and we have seen various titles uh, in connection with this subject we are meditating on the uh, on the deity of our lord jesus christ and we are told that about the pre existence of our lord that the divine names that are given to him then the divine worship that is ascribed to him the divine qualities uh, possessed by him we were meditating on these subjects and today lord willing we will come to the next topic that is the divine attributes possessed by him <laughs> so let us uh, sit in the presence of god prayerfully so that we may behold the beauty and the glory of our lord and savior <laughs> so <clears throat> when we think about the divine attributes uh, we know that three important things uh, they came into our mind the attributes of god that is as we see in psalm 139 it is the omnipotence the omnipresence and the omniscience of our god and when we look to the lord jesus christ we can see in a very clear way that our lord has possessed all these three attributes these three are the essential attributes of god and unless a person has these attributes we can never consider him as god when we meet people usually we present these aspects before them so that they may think about the persons whom they worship and they would understand whether uh, the object of their worship is truly god or not <clears throat> so let us look to these three attributes of our lord jesus christ in a brief way this morning and let us continue uh, our studies the first one is about the omnipotence of our lord jesus christ we all know the meaning of that word omnipotence means that he is almighty he is all powerful what is the meaning of that word as we apply it to the lord jesus christ this is not about any physical power our lord has but it is more than that it is about the sovereign power of god it is the sovereign authority of our god that is what we are uh, looking to in the scripture when we say that he is all powerful we are not thinking how what all things he can do by virtue of his physical strength but because of the authority the supreme authority he has we can see that our lord can do what all things and as we proceed let me tell you a beautiful truth that when we say that our lord is able to do all things he is all powerful we have to understand that the the almighty power of god 
is well balanced by his moral attributes that is he can do only those things that are right that are good and that are holy in the presence of god he cannot do anything as we read in uh, the epistle to titus chapter 1 and verse 2 like this that god cannot lie so that is the nature of god so christ also cannot lie so his almighty power is limited there if he lies then he cannot be god because he is not holy then but since our god is holy he cannot lie but that doesn't mean that he is not all powerful so when our lord jesus christ was tempted by satan say he did not do what the satan asked him to do why because it is not according to his nature so <clears throat> here we can see that uh, how our lord is omnipotent he is all powerful and this almighty power of god is in well balance with his moral attributes so in the next slide we are going to see some of the verses which we are familiar with so that we can see uh, uh, what all things are uh, we can learn in connection with his omnipotence <clears throat> we can see various uh, verses uh, uh, over here and uh, let me tell you that most of these verses are very familiar to us especially Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 where our lord says that all authority or all power in heaven and earth is given unto me so when we come to uh, revelation chapter 1 and verse 8 there we read like this i am the alpha and omega the beginning and the ending saith the lord which is uh, and which was and which is to come the almighty so there we can see that the word almighty is applied to the lord jesus christ he has all power in heaven and earth in this connection i would like to draw your attention to one of the names uh, our lord has got in connection with the in the history of abraham abraham knew god as the el elion the one who is the most high the one who is the the one who is uh, on uh, on the supreme authority and he always looked to god as the el elion god and he is the el shaddai god the one who is all mighty or all sufficient and our god has got this uh, these attributes and the same attributes we can see in the lord jesus christ because he could say that all authority in heaven and earth is given to me he is the almighty god then when we come to john chapter 17 and verse 2 uh, there we read like this as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him see there we read that as thou hast given him power over all flesh so he has the power over all the living things over all men so that he can give eternal life to those people who are being given to him by the father again when we come to Ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 to 22 we can see that how uh, great is the power our lord is having uh, as apostle paul is describing uh, these things Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 20 to 22 we have, we read like this which he wrote in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is 
not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under the feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So here we can see how our Lord is placed as the one who is at the right hand of the Father. We know the meaning of that word right hand as used in the scripture. It is always speaking uh, of various things. And one of those things is the right hand speaks of the power. And our Lord Jesus Christ is at the Father's right hand. He is at a place where he has the power over everything. Now, this omnipotence of our God, as we, uh, under, uh, as we study that subject, we can see that our Lord has exercised while he was in this world. He exercised this power in, <coughs> in various ways. First of all, he exercised his power on earth. We read uh, in various uh, verses, especially we are all familiar with those uh, verses, uh, that he had power over disease. While he was in this world, he was his life was really uh, acquainted with grief, acquainted with the sickness of the people. He was a person who knew what sickness uh, is as he, as he walked around the people who were physically ill. And he healed them. Now, uh, just for a reference, I have mentioned one verse here. Uh, that is Luke chapter 4 and verse, uh, verses 38 to 41. There we primarily read about uh, what our Lord has uh, done in connection with, uh, uh, with uh, healing uh, Peter's mother-in-law. <coughs> we can see that when Jesus went into Peter's house, there he saw Peter's mother-in-law. She was taken with great fever. She was ill. And our Lord healed her. And she was healed instantly and immediately. And what did she do? She started serving the Lord. So that is the great power our Lord had over the disease. She was down with fever. But when our Lord healed her, she was healed in a moment. And without any, any other difficulties, she was healed. And not only that, she was able to serve the Lord. She was able to do things. Not only that, her fever went, but she got the strength to serve the Lord. And that is speaking of the absolute authority our Lord has over the physical diseases. So he had power on earth on the physical diseases of people. Then when we come to John chapter 2 and verse 9, there we can see the first sign which our Lord has done. And it was turning water into wine. And that speaks of his power over nature. He had power over nature. Say, one substance, the water, is turned into wine. A, a drastic change has happened. A colorless liquid has become a colorful liquid. A tasteless liquid has become a tasty liquid. Uh, there, there was a great change in the properties of that liquid. There was a great change. And that speaks of his power over nature. Again, when we uh, when we come to uh, when we come to Matthew chapter eight and verse twenty six, we can see how our Lord wielded power over other natural forces like the sea, like the uh, like the wind, the storm. Uh, when our Lord rebuked, everything was calm. He could control the wind and the sea. He is having power over these forces of nature. We know that when we uh, confront such situations in our life, we, we will be frustrated. We can't do anything like the disciples of the Lord. But our Lord could easily control the situation because he has power over nature. Then 
we, when we come to Matthew chapter 14 and verse 25, we can see our Lord walking on the water. Say his disciples were uh, in that wind and in that troublous sea. And our Lord came over there walking on the water. As he was defying all the laws of gravity, he was walking on the water. And we know that we can't do that. So our Lord exercised authority over nature. We have, uh, we have various proofs and these are some of them. Then we can see that how our Lord, he had power over death while he was in this world. He, uh, he healed the people. Not only that, he raised the people from death. And Lazarus, the story of Lazarus as recorded in John chapter 11. We are familiar with that. Lord Jesus Christ came to the tomb of Lazarus. And he called forth, Lazarus, come forth. And he came uh, with a word. He could bring Lazarus back to life. And it is the same thing happened. Uh, in connection with the, that widow's son of uh, that village of Nain, where our Lord, he brought that young man back to life with his word. And say the same thing happened in the house of Jairus when his daughter was dead. Our Lord went over there and he raised the dead. All these places we can see how he has power over death. Now we know that Death is our greatest enemy. And we always struggle to overcome death. But when our Lord Jesus Christ was here, death could not stand before him. Whenever and wherever he confronted death, death fled away. In connection with these, with these three, we can remember that. And I remember as one Lord's servant mentioned like this, the two thieves who were crucified with the Lord, they could not die before the Lord because in the presence of God, death has no stay. Death has to flee from the presence of our Lord. So he has power over death. Now, when we look to these three instances of raising the dead, let me tell you that Jairus' daughter was raised just after she was dead. Vito's son was raised while they were on the way to the cemetery and Lazarus was uh, uh, raised after four days. So we can understand that our Lord has power over death and there is no limitation of time, whether it be four days or whether it be four millennia, our Lord can raise the dead. He has power over death. Then we can see that our Lord has power over hell. That is what we can gather <coughs> from the following portions where we can see how our Lord overcame uh, the powers over uh, hell. He had power over demons. We all know the story in Mark chapter 5, how our Lord he healed that person who was affected with legions of demons. He could, When he asked his name, he said, my name is Legion. Because a lot of demons were there and he was captivated by these demons. But our Lord confronted that person and we can see that he was cleansed of all these demons. He was delivered of these demons and our Lord exercised his authority over demons. So even demons or the hell cannot stand before him. He has authority over it. And as we have just read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 20 to 22, we can see that our Lord has power over heaven. Yes, he could rightly say that all power or all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. He is having power over heaven. And John chapter 17 and verse 2, we have read, there we saw how our Lord has got power over, uh, uh, power to give eternal life. And as we proceed to the next slide, we can see that he has power to transform our wild bodies 
as we read in Philippians chapter 3 and verse, verse 20 and 21, that he can transform our vile bodies to the body of his glory. And our God, our Lord, he has power to transform, to change our bodies. The total, uh, the total, the substance of our body will be changed and we would be uh, transformed uh, in that day. <clears throat> and along with that, I just wanted to uh, remind you about uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, where we read that he is able to save us to the uttermost. He can save us totally. He can save us altogether. But a great Lord we has, and we can say that he is truly our God and truly our Lord. Along with Job, we can also confess that our Lord, he is the one who is having authority over all things. I know that thou can do everything. Nothing is too hard for him. He is the one who can do all things. So let us praise God for our Savior because he is God and he has power over all things. That is one of the attributes we can see. Next, we can come to the omniscience of our Lord. Uh, as the word says, omniscience, we know that he is an all-knowing God. Our God, he knows everything. While Jesus Christ was in this world, he... he he manifested uh, his attribute, his omniscience, while he was in this world. We can uh, look to the word of God and we can have ample uh, evidences for that. John chapter 16 and verse 30. Uh, we can see how our Lord was having that time uh, in the upper room with his dis uh, disciples. And in that parting words, the disciples uh, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and they say like this, Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this believe, we believe that thou camest forth from God. The disciples, they come to the Lord Jesus Christ and they say that, Now we are sure that thou knowest all things. Thou knowest all things. Uh, in connection with that, we can look to verse 19 also of the same chapter. There the disciples were discussing uh, a phrase which our Lord was saying uh, a little while. They were discussing about it. What is the meaning of this phrase? A little while. What is he saying? But they did not dare to ask the Lord. But Lord knew their thoughts. That is what we read in verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him all the secrets of these disciples. Our Lord knew. And also, he knows our secrets because he is an all-knowing God. He knows the end from the beginning. He is an all-knowing God. When we come to John chapter 2 and verses 24 and 25, there we again have uh, an example of uh, uh, his uh, omniscience. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew everything. He knew the nature of man. He knew the thoughts of man. He knew what is in man. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he is an all-knowing and when we come to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, uh, as Apostle Paul uh, is bringing before us the, uh, the great omniscience of our Lord, he says like this, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he has the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he is an all-knowing God. He is an omniscient one. Uh, let us thank God for our Lord because of his omniscience. And we have various, uh, various uh, uh, illustrations to say about uh, this omniscience of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when we come to uh, John chapter 4, we know as our Lord was uh, 
having that uh, personal conversation uh, with that Samaritan woman. We can see that this woman was trying to uh, trying to cover what all uh, her uh, yeah, past life was. But Lord very clearly told before that woman what she is. He brought before her. He brought before her what she was and what she is. He knew everything inside out of that woman. And as he revealed this truth to that woman, really she was astonished. And she, her appreciation of the Lord Jesus Christ was improved. And we can see that ultimately she confessed him as the Lord. <laughs> Let me we come to uh, uh, the, there when we come to Mark chapter 2. Uh, in connection uh, with our Lord's visit to the village of Capernaum, we can see that our Lord was uh, in one particular house and there was a very uh, a huge crowd uh, gathered over there and they wanted to bring one person uh, who was uh, affected with palsy and our uh, Lord, uh, before healing that person, he said like this, that your sins are forgiven. And... When the Lord said that, the, the Pharisees and the other people who gathered over there, they started murmuring. They started thinking and murmuring among themselves. Uh, who is he who can forgive sins? Then the Lord, he knew their thoughts. Our Lord is able to perceive. He is able to understand what exactly is being thought by the people. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything. Yes, we can say it like that. Uh, there is no word in my mouth without thy knowledge. When, uh, when we come to John chapter 1 and verse 48, there we read uh, our Lord Jesus Christ was uh, uh, speaking to uh, spe uh, speaking to Nathanael. And Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Uh, the Nathanael is asking him, Whence knowest thou me? So our Lord knew Nathanael even before Nathanael was introduced to Christ. Wherever we be, our Lord is knowing what is going on with us or in us. He knows us. That is speaking of the omniscient knowledge of our Lord. Now, our Lord always granted us an impression that he knew all things in detail, both the past and the future, past, present, and future. He knows everything. Every uh, Monday, we are trying to learn from the Olivet Discourse. And in that Olivet Discourse, our Lord is saying what is exactly going to happen. As we have seen and we are going to learn from that uh, scripture portion that as the Lord has said, it so happened in connection with the temple at Jerusalem that each and every stone was uh, turned and taken away. Yes, our words of the Lord, it is pure and it is true. It stands, it is established. Because he knows everything. And he always brings before us this truth that he is an all-knowing God. He knows our past. He knows our future. He knows what is in the darkness. Because light dwelleth with him. He is having an eye that, that can reach anywhere and everywhere. Our Lord is an omniscient Lord. So... When we say about this omniscience, we have to uh, we have to understand that uh, some people they uh, bring before us uh, a verse uh, that is from Mark chapter thirteen and verse thirty two that uh, 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 may not be written on the slide. Mark chapter thirteen and verse thirty two, there our Lord was confronted. Uh, our Lord said a statement which sometimes the skeptics bring before us and say that our Lord did not do, did not know everything. There we read like that. But of that day, 
and that tower knoweth no man, no not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. <coughs> now, some people, they will show us this verse and they will uh, tell us that, see here the Lord Jesus Christ himself said that regarding that day, the Son of Man also does not know. So he is not an all-knowing God. He knows many things, but he is not an all-knowing God. So people may bring before us such an argument, but we have to understand that the omniscience of our Lord Jesus Christ was perfect and there is no failure in that. But as concerning his humanity, there are times here we can see that he chose not to know something which, he, which is being kept under the power of the Father. As a man, he was not knowing those things. But as the omniscient God, he knew it. <clears throat> and we have to be very careful. Now, we know that our Lord is uh, he's an all-powerful God. But there are times when he did not act. Even, even now, we know that there are times when our Lord is not acting according to our prayers, but he is acting according to his will. So he has that authority. He can choose what to know as a human and what not to uh, know. So that verse is not contradicting the omniscient knowledge of our Lord, but it is, uh, it is saying that as a human, uh, as a man, our Lord sought not to know those things, those, those aspects uh, in the program of God. Now we come to the next thing that is the omnipresence of our Lord. And uh, we, can, uh, we can know uh, that familiar verse, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, and Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, where our Lord is uh, promising of his presence uh, uh, amongst his people. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, we uh, read like this, that uh, uh, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Uh, this is a familiar verse, and we often caught this verse. So we know that at a given time, there would be gatherings in various places. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord would be present in each and every such gathering. Just for an example, we can think of the Sunday <coughs> uh, gathering time. Various places in India, they are gathering at almost the same time. And he is present in every such gathering. How can he do that? Only because he is an omnipresent God. He can be present everywhere at the same time. And we know that he gave his disciples this promise. I am with you until the end of the age. So the presence of the Lord is promised to them. It is promised to all the disciples, not only to them, even to us also. Because that promise is for the end of the age, for this whole age. And we know that we are scattered in various places, but our Lord is with us. All this speaking about the omnipresence of our Lord. But there we can see a very clear verse in John chapter 3 and verse 13, where our Lord is mentioning about his omnipresence, John chapter 3 and verse 13. <coughs> there we read like this. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Look to that verse. What can we gather from that verse? He says that the one, uh, the one who is in heaven, uh, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So the Son of Man, while this uh, saying these words, our Lord says that he is in heaven. And at the same time, he was with, this, uh, with, uh, with uh, Nicodemus. And he is uh, saying that he came down from heaven. So at the same time, he could say that I came down from heaven 
and I am in heaven. How can this be possible? This can be possible only if our Lord is omnipresent. So our Lord is an omnipresent Lord. While, in, while uh, during his ministry in the earth, he clearly taught us that he is an omnipresent Lord. He is an omniscient God and he is an omnipresent God. So all these uh, attributes clearly uh, tell us that our Lord, he is God, he is truly God. He, maybe he is literally present at one place, but at the same time, he is present everywhere. As I mentioned, I have just brought before you only certain scripture portions. But we have a lot of scriptures supporting these three attributes of our Lord. Let us understand that his eyes are everywhere. As we just read in connection with Nathaniel, that he could say that, not only that he knew Nathaniel, he could say that, I saw you. He is seeing us wherever we are. Now, before going further, let me tell you one thing, that since our God is an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent Lord, we have to be very fearful. We have to be very godly as we live in this world. Sometimes uh, we may lose the sense of these virtues of our Lord, these attributes of our Lord, and we may drift away, and we may, uh, we may go away from God. So that is to be a word of caution uh, as we understand these virtues or the attributes of our Lord. Now, let me go further. Uh, let us look to uh, the divine offices that are assigned to our Lord. Till now, we are looking to the divine attributes. Now, divine offices assigned to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to the Bible, we can see that the Lord Jesus Christ is pictured as the creator. We have various familiar verses before us. John chapter 1 and verse 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That says that Jesus Christ is the creator. He is the active power of creation. He is the active agent of creation. <clears throat> he is the creator. The same truth is conveyed in various other portions of the scripture, like Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. There we read that uh, our Lord is the one who made the heaven and the earth. Then Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, uh, as uh, we come to that portion, we can see that how clearly it is mentioned that our Lord is the creator. Uh, let me read that verse, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So there we can see that Jesus Christ is very clearly pictured as the creator of the world. Now, when we look to the creation story, we can understand that from Genesis chapter 1, God the Father was present there. Then the Holy Spirit was present there. And we can see the word of God there. And in the light of the New Testament, we can say that the triune God involved in the creation. The triune God involved in the creation. So Jesus Christ is mentioned in the scripture as the creator. And we can see that while Lord Jesus Christ was in this world, there are times when he manifested this office. For example, he could multiply the five loaves of bread into such a quantity that was sufficient for the thousands of people gathered over there. John chapter 21, when our Lord Jesus Christ was meeting his disciples, he provided them food. 
and that food was provided by our Lord in a miraculous way. That's it is the creatorial power of our God manifested over there. He is the creator that we can see uh, in his life and also through the scripture. He is the creator. Now, in the book of Colossians, uh, uh, the epistle to the Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 16, we saw that all things were created by him. And all things were created <coughs> by him or other way. Uh, otherwise, we can say that all things were created through him. And all things were created for him. He is the source of the creation. He is the agent of creation. And he is the end of the creation. He is the purpose for which everything is created. And uh, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, we read that he is uh, the beginning of the creation. Or in other words, he is the origin of the creation. So Lord Jesus Christ uh, is, has the office of a creator, which is very clearly mentioned in the scripture. Then we can see that he is pictured as the upholder of all things. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, we read like this. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The same truth we can see in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. We can see that he is the upholder of all things. So we know that God is the one who can uphold all things. God is the one who is controlling all the system of this universe. And Christ is pictured as the person who is upholding. So again, that is a very clear uh, indication that as the upholder of all things, our Lord Jesus Christ is God. Then the third thing is he has the right to forgive sins. Now, again, when we come to Mark chapter 2, and verses 5 to 10, uh, in connection with healing that palsied man, we can see that there was a murmuring over, over there. Who can forgive sins but God? Yes, God is the one who can forgive sins. Because each and every sin man commits is against God. So God as the judge, he is the one who can forgive sins. But in Mark chapter 2, we can see that our Lord Jesus Christ is forgiving sins. So that is a clear indication, again, that our Lord Jesus Christ is God himself. Then he has the right to raise the dead. We have seen that already in connection, uh, in connection with the uh, 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 the other portions, and uh, again we can see that he is the he has the right uh, over uh, or to raise the dead. And Lord Jesus Christ often declared that that he has the right to raise the dead. Uh, uh, when we come to John chapter eleven and verse twenty five, we can see that uh, he says that I am the resurrection and life. So he pictured himself as the resurrection and life. That means he is the one who can bring back the dead to life. Again, in John chapter 6 and verse 39, our Lord says like this, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at that at the last day so lord says that he is having the authority to raise the dead there are various uh, other reference which we uh, can see over here in the screen that he is the one who has the right to raise the dead uh, he as uh, as the one who can bring back people to life then the next thing i would like to bring to your notice that he is the judge of all men. So the Lord, God is pictured as the judge of all the earth. And here we read that Jesus Christ is saying that he is the one who is the judge, in fact, of all the earth. John chapter 5 and verse 22, 
for the father judgeth no man but hath committed all judgment unto the son so lord jesus christ is ultimately the judge he is the one who is going to judge people now uh, when we meditate from uh, from matthew chapter 24 and 25 we will come to the truth that there will be a day when our lord himself will be sitting in uh, in that uh, throne of glory and he will be uh, judging people and we know that we are all waiting for that day that after the rapture we are all going to be uh, uh, manifested before the throne of our lord jesus christ who is going to review and reward us so he is the one who is going to judge all men the believers and the unbelievers so our lord jesus christ is the judge of all men so these are the five officers we can see assigned to the lord jesus christ he is the he is the creator he is the upholder of all things he has the right to forgive sins he is the one who brings the dead back to life and he is the judge of all men and before closing i would like to draw your attention to the seventh aspect in connection uh, with the uh, deity of our lord jesus christ and that is his name is coupled with that of god the father <coughs> our lord jesus christ name is mentioned various times in the scripture along with the father when we look to the epistles of apostle paul often we can see that but very clearly we can see that how the triune god is mentioned together in that baptismal formula in matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 there we can see that clear reference uh, how the three persons in the godhead god the father god the son and god the spirit are mentioned together we read like this go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and of the holy spirit so there we can see that the triune god is mentioned over there and similarly in that benediction uh, which we read in second corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14 where apostle paul closes that epistle he says that the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the communion of the holy ghost be with you all so there again we can see the three names mentioned together there are various other instances we can see these three persons together but there are two verses where the three names are very clearly mentioned so we can see that the name of the lord jesus christ is mentioned in association with god the father and the holy spirit and as i said in every letter almost every letter to the so assemblies apostle paul is uh, uh, taking the name of god the father and the son he says that grace and peace be unto you from god the father and jesus christ the son so the name of the father and son are coupled together in various places this says that bible keeps lord jesus christ equal with god equal with god the father equal with all the persons in the uh, in the trinity and we have to understand that there are no other names coupled in a similar way to these three names apostle paul is not saying that grace and peace be unto you from god the father and jesus christ the son and me the apostle he is not saying like that he never dared to couple his name with the name of god the father and jesus christ that says that these three persons they are of the same level they are god and they are of equal uh, position even name of mary the mother of jesus was not mentioned in equality with god the father or lord jesus christ now <coughs> the lord himself said once like this uh, in john chapter 10 and verse 30 i and my father 
R1. He clearly says that how he is coupled to the Father. So we can see that our Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, is equal to God and he is God himself. So uh, we are meditating upon uh, this great truth and we have seen seven aspects in connection with the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ and may God help us to understand this truth in a more deeper way in the days to come. And it would encourage our devotion and worship to the Lord. In the will of God, we would be contemplating the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ in the coming session. So uh, let us uh, thank God for giving us his beloved son, the one who is equal to him and giving him as a perfect man so that we can know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. May his name be glorified.